Good morning, and welcome to La Jolla Presbyterian Church Podcast. Today we're joined by our Director of Women's Ministries, Cynthia Blaze. Cynthia is leading a women's Bible study on Wednesday mornings in conjunction with our 31-week series, The Story, and we want to share it with you. Cynthia, would you tell us a little bit more about this class? Thank you, Jim. I'm really excited to be going through the whole Bible with a wonderful group of ladies in this class. We have a great community and encourage you to join us. We also understand that not everybody can make it every week or may not be in the area. That's why we're recording and sharing this content. We're following a book called The Story. It's a chronological journey through the Bible, and we'll tackle one chapter per week. If you're in La Jolla on Wednesday mornings, we'd love to have you join us. Thank you, Cynthia, for sharing your gifts with this larger audience. And thank you for listening. We hope this study is a blessing to you. Feel free to share it with a friend. And if you have any questions about the church, or if there's any way we can pray for you, you can find our website at ljpress.org. Without further ado, here's this week's discussion. Hi, good morning, ladies. First, I'd like to start us um, with just a quick prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. I pray that you will center all of us, center me, center my heart, and help us to focus. Help us to learn and grow, and I pray that you will speak your truth through me as we study this. In the name of Jesus, amen. So uh, Saturday, uh, we had one of our first sort of uh, big scares. I, it was my birthday last week, and so my husband had gotten me a massage, which is lovely. So I had had my massage on Saturday, and I get out of my massage, and I check my phone, and there's a text from my husband that says, call me ASAP, which I have never gotten one of those texts before. Call me ASAP. And so I call him, and I'm like, what? What? And he says, don't pick up Axel. It was my son, my seven-and-a-half-year-old from his play date. We are at urgent care. Uh, I know. And like, have you guys had probably one of those moments where it just feels like time stops, right? And you're suddenly like in slow motion. <laughs> and I was like, what happened? And so he's like, he's fine. He has some cuts on his legs. And I was like, what happened? And he said, glass shattered on him. Um, and of course, my next question is, because I'm a little bit vain inside, is how's his face? Because, you know, he's seven and he has this sweet little beautiful face. And and my husband says, his face is fine. Come to urgent care. So I'm like, okay. So I hang up. So then I call my girlfriend whose house he was at. And she says that somehow the two boys are playing. I mean, they're seven and a half. And one of them slammed a shower door really hard. And the whole glass shattered over my son. So just shattered. So... I get to urgent care, and luckily, because I was designed to teach theology and not designed for medicine, and I have, like, no, like, medical tolerance, and so I get there, and, like, luckily, he's being almost, he's sewn up. He's got stitches in his knees, in one knee, and his toes, but they're pretty much, like, cleaning him up, which, um, and he's fine. Like, he's, he's fine. I mean, we're all scared, but it's fine, and so um, we go home. Um, put him on some pain meds and, um, you know, he's really stiff, but he's doing okay. So then Sunday night I was praying with him and I typically pray with my son. Like he rarely ever sort of volunteers to pray. That's just not kind of how it works with him yet. Um, so I'm praying and I'm praying and, and I'm just, you know, thanking God for his protection that it wasn't worse than it was. And he stops me and he says, mommy, can I pray? And so, of course, I'm like, by all means, pray away. And so he just says, and it was this really poignant moment. He says, God, thank you for being my umbrella. And I just stopped. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean, buddy? And he said, mommy, he said, when the glass broke, I felt there was an umbrella over me. I felt it. And he said, mommy, God takes care of me. And I had this moment, and I realized afterwards, sort of as we put the pieces together, that when the glass had broken, he had not gotten touched. But what had happened is that he got scared or something, and he fell. And when he fell into the glass, he got his knee and his toes. But he was not touched when it actually broke, which is amazing to me. And, and I started pondering that. And even thinking through, as we have been you know, studying in this Bible study so far, we've been looking at the stories of Abraham and Joseph, and Moses, and they're often called into situations that are really hard, that aren't necessarily good, 
And what we see coming from that is that they experience God through it. And I had this really, this moment of sort of stepping back and realizing, oh my gosh, like I'm actually, now that he's fine, thankful for this incident, because for the first time, my son actually experienced God in a way that he's never experienced God before. I mean, we talk about God, we sing about God, we go to church, like we're God, God, God. But he hadn't had this personal experience with God. And it also made me step back and just realize, you know what? The Lord is protecting my children. And it was this moment even for me of sort of like experiencing God again. And so it really was this big eye-opener to me of even really thinking through these stories of how um, we do, you know, we don't want anything bad to happen to any of us. But it really is in those moments that we have this kind of experience of God. And I was actually reminded of, we sort of skipped through it when we talked about Ishmael and Hagar, but there's this moment where Hagar um, flees into the desert. She's kind of kicked out by Sarah. And um, the, an angel of the Lord meets her by a spring. And she has this great experience of meeting God. And he sends her back and he says, I will be with you and I'll protect you. Return. And she at that moment says, calls God. He's, she says, you are my El Roy, the God who sees me. And she sort of names God. And I realize that in this moment, my son has forever named God. He says, God is my umbrella. And it was such a really neat experience for me of having that with him. So, oh, great. So, um, because realizing that what God wants most from us is, we've been talking about this. What is it? Relationship. That's what we've been talking about this whole time, that what God wants most from us is relationship. And so it was a neat experience for me, even though it was traumatic at first, but we're all okay. Um, so as we have been doing this Bible study, we have been talking about the continuous story of Scripture. That's really been our focus, correct? And then um, as we are in the Old Testament, we are looking for the expectation for Jesus in the Old Testament. So that's where we, that's sort of the big picture of what we're doing. Um, I'm going to just review again, just to kind of get us all up to speed. So our first week we talked about creation where God says, let us make mankind in our image. And we get the sense that there is an us from the beginning, this triune God that we call him, this three in one. Um, We also understand that God created humans for a purpose and the purpose is relationship. Exactly. So remember ladies, I want you to talk to me during this Bible study. I don't want to talk to you the whole time. So relationship. And then at the fall, there's this prophecy that's given over the serpent. The enmity will follow between the offspring of Eve and the offspring of the serpent. And that the serpent will strike the heel of the offspring, but the offspring will crush his head. And with that, we get the sense that the serpent striking the heel of Eve is what? The, 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 the offspring of the Eve, the serpent striking the heel of the offspring of the Eve. What is that that we see happen later on with Jesus? The crucifixion, right. We, so Jesus is scarred, essentially, in the crucifixion. But the offspring of Eve will crush the head of Satan. And what is that? The resurrection. And then we talked about that right now. We live in the between um, the full crushing. We, we're in the partial crushing now, and we await the time of the full crushing, right? We live in this time where Satan does have power. And we, it's sort of a cosmic warfare that's going on around us, but we wait for that moment in the final crushing when Jesus returns and that he will wipe all the tears from our eyes. Um, so we, what we are beginning to figure out is that somehow an offspring of Eve will bring about the end of Satan. Uh, we've talked about the patriarchs, how God established a covenant relationship with Abraham, which, which was reestablished reestablished with Isaac and then with Jacob. And we talked about there are three parts of this covenant. Do you ladies remember what the three parts of the covenant are? There's first, anyone? There's kind of three P words. Progeny. There we go. Progeny. Place. Good. And then what's the last one? Promise. Exactly. So there's the progeny. There's this that um, the Abraham will have more offspring than the stars in the sky, right? It's a progeny place that they will have the land of Canaan as their forever inheritance. And this greater promise that somehow all the nations on the earth will be blessed through this offspring of Eve. So, or this offspring of Abraham, sorry. Um, And then what did Abraham have to do? What was the one thing that he had to do to keep this covenant at that point? Circumcision, correct. So all the males had to be circumcised. It was setting them apart and making them different. Um, We talked about how this blessing also gets passed um, from Isaac, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And then who, after Jacob receives the blessing, which of the 12 sons of Israel receives a blessing? Judah. Great. And that we learned that 
when this blessing is given, that there's a prophecy that's given over Judah. It says the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations will be his. So we talk about that there's an expect, what is the expectation that is created from this prophecy? What do the Israelites then begin to expect? A king. A king will come from the line of Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah. So when Jesus arrives on the scene, there is an expectation for a Messiah or a leader in the Jewish mindset that is created through Scripture. Um, and, we're, and we see that that expectation comes from right there, from that prophecy over Judah. That's where it begins. And that we know that ultimately that Jesus, as that descendant, is going to be the ultimate king that comes. And I talked about that's why... And like Matthew, when we have this huge genealogy chart, it's so important for these biblical writers to trace the the genealogy of Jesus back to Judah, because they want to show this is the king. This is the king that was expected to come. Um, So we also talked about how God uses Moses to begin his secret rescue plan, right? That to return his people to Canaan. And what did we talk about with Moses? He was, we talked about how he was raised in the court of Pharaoh. And why was that important? What was important? Education, exactly. He was educated. And why was it important that Moses would be educated? Because what did he write? Five books, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. So he had to have been educated. God set him in this spot so that he would be educated and he would be able to write these five original books for us. Uh, We realize that there is um, a good plan. That He had a good plan, but he tried it on his own means. After 40 years of tending sheep in the desert, God shows up in a burning bush. But Moses resists, right? And he says, send someone, send someone else. Um, But Moses and Aaron confront Pharaoh. There's the 10 plagues. Um, I do want to say a correction from last week. One of you ladies came up to me and told me that Aaron is actually three years older than Moses. um, And that that's why he was not actually killed. Because as one of those babies that was born, one of those infant boys, because he was older. Um, Miriam was actually six when Moses was born and Aaron was three. So... Um, little, little extra research. Uh, Moses was 80. Uh, we learned this from Exodus 7, 7, where it says Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they went to speak to Pharaoh. Um, so the decree was only that new babies, boys, would be killed. We also talked about the last plague, how it was the death of the firstborn son. That Remember that it was, what were the Israelites supposed to do to not have the plague? Put the blood of the lamb where? On their doorposts. And what would happen? Death would what? Pass over. So death would pass over their houses. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ is our Passover lamb. He has been sacrificed for us. So we start to get what that means, right? The sense that death has passed over those households. Death passes over us when Jesus, when we accept Jesus as our Passover lamb. Um, the Israelites finally are allowed to lead. God, leave. God leads them. Um, what leads them by day? Remember, it's two things. A cloud. What leads them by night? Fire, exactly. And that God leads them to the Red Sea, and who pursues them? Pharaoh. And the Israelites grumble. Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you led us here to die in the desert? Which I love. Um, and then those powerful words of Moses that follow. Do not be afraid. Stand firm. Oops. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. I love that. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Such amazing words. Do not be afraid, but stand still. I love that. And how God brings them to that moment of being between the Red Sea and the Egyptians so that he can be glorified and so that they will experience him. And then the sea parts, they're delivered, the journey begins, and the shortest route to Canaan would be 250 miles. But it says that God does not bring them on the shortest route. And what he wants most of them is relationship. But God acts in a way to create relationship with the Israelites as they begin this desert journey. He provides for them on a daily basis what rains down at night. Do you ladies remember? What rains down at night, actually? Quail. Quail rains down at night. And what sort of rises from the ground in the morning? The manna. Exactly. So bread and meat every day are provided. And how much are they allowed to collect each day? Do you remember? Just enough for that day, right? They could not collect more. And if they did collect more, what would happen to it? It would rot. And so God wanted them to trust in him every day to provide for them, protect for them, except on which day, which on Friday, how much were they allowed to collect? 
enough for Sabbath, enough for two days. So they, God also establishes on the Sabbath, you do not work. So on the sixth day of the week, they are allowed, to, which was Saturday, Friday for them, they are allowed to collect two times the amount. And then that will not rot and will remain for the, for the following day. Um, so that brings us up to today. Today, we're going to look at where did our Ten Commandments come from? What is their purpose? And we're also going to talk about the tabernacle. So let's start with context because, as one of my old seminary professors would say, context is king. So author, who wrote the book of Moses? I mean, book of Exodus. <laughs> Answer. <laughs> who wrote the book of Exodus? Moses. Yay. Audience, who was it written to? The Israelites, exactly. And this was important to remember because these books, these first five books of the Pentateuch, were written to a specific people and a specific time with a specific purpose. And we need to understand that to understand these books. So when was it written? When was it written? Anyone remember? We, we know when Moses died. Does anybody remember that date? Moses died in, you guys are close, 1406, 1406 BC. So obviously all these books had to have been written before he died because he proclaims himself as the author of them. Um, so we believe that the Exodus happened somewhere around 1440, 1450 BC. Um, original intent, who were, who were these books written to? We already said it. Israelites, awesome. Um, historical context, what was going on in the ancient Near East at this point? Um, who was the big superpower? Egypt. Egypt was the big superpower. Who was the other superpower on the rise? Who's coming up? Babylonians, Assyria, exactly. So Egypt is our big superpower. Assyria is on the rise. They're going to come in to be big players later on. Um, so, um, and then biblical context, where does Exodus fall in the full Bible? Where does it fall? Second book, exactly. Genesis, Exodus. Perfect. Uh, and then John wrote, what kind of writing is Exodus? Historical, exactly. So it's supposed to be understood literally. It's supposed to be understood um, historically. Okay, so let's get to our text for today. So for three months, they journey into the desert, and they, they, they've left Egypt. They journey for three months into the desert, and they arrive at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was actually where Moses had seen God in the burning bush. So they have returned back to where God originally spoke to Moses. Um, so God had promised him. He said, you will know that I am God when I bring you back here. And so he does. So, Mo so they return um, back to the area of Mount Sinai. I'm going to start in Exodus 19. Let's see. We are going to go through all of the rest of Exodus today and fast forward. Starting with 19, 1 through 9, and then 16 through 19. All right. Yes. All right. So on the first day, this is uh, 19, on the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt. So we're given a specific time, third month after they left Egypt. On the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then that of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back down and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will see, will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Skipping over to verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the front of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, Moses spoke and, his vo and the voice of God answered him. 
Amazing. Okay, so we call this covenant renewal at this point. Um, God had covenanted with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And so now the question is, will their descendants covenant with him as well? Um, And so what does God ask the Israelites to do in verse 5? What are they to do? Obey and keep his commandments. Exactly. Um, And if they do, what will happen to the Israelites? What will they be? Chosen people, his treasured possession, a special kingdom of priests. It's interesting, yesterday at um, staff meeting, I was chatting with Jim Cedric, and he said, you know, it's so interesting. God is not saying you're going to be this conquering nation. You're not, you're not going to be these warlords. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. And how that's how God designed them from the very beginning, to be set apart, to be people that are dedicated to him. Um, what do the elders of Israelites say they will do? Verse 8. They, they will do everything the Lord says. So God descends in this very visual and audible way. Imagine smoke, fire, mountain trembling, trumpet blowing. Um, so God is really showing up to establish his covenant. He's saying, I am real. I am here. Follow me. Um, and then when Moses speaks, what does God actually do in Verse 19, what does it say? God does what? He answers him. Like, imagine, like, speaking, and that goes, God, like, audibly, like, answers you. <laughs> like, I just think that would be amazing. <laughs> so, so God is going to speak to Abraham, and he gives him the terms of this covenant. We call it the law. These are the laws that Israel must keep to keep this covenant intact. So, from the very beginning, there was effort on the Israelites' part. It wasn't just, oh, whatever you do, you're good. Like, the Israelites had to keep their part of this covenant um, to be for this blessing to continue for them. So I'm going to read Exodus 20, 1 through 20 now. Um, and these are what we call the Ten Commandments. This is what God says. Um, this is what you need to keep. And God spoke all these words. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You are to have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents, the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not... Um, Sorry, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or male or female servant, his or her donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Okay. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Awesome. All right, so... Worship God alone. Treat others kindly. Trust God to provide for you. That's the Sabbath, the meaning of rest. It's trust. It's that I don't have to work seven days a week because I trust that the Lord is going to provide for me. Um, Be content with what you have. These are all the basic um, summing up of these Ten Commandments. Um, I was struck by Mike when he preached on Sunday, how he talked about how there was no, imagined having no law. Like this was like a new thing that there were laws that were given. I mean, imagine a lawless society. So in so many ways, I realized like how the laws were a blessing, right? 
Because before this, like, I was actually having dinner with a couple of girlfriends last night, and my friend is like, I mean, who knew you were supposed to murder? I mean, Moses murdered. Remember, like earlier, he kills an Egyptian because an Egyptian is attacking an Israelite. And she was like, you know, we sort of take all this for granted. But imagine, like, if you didn't know, oh, like, if I, she was like, I'm really glad that my husband won't murder me. I mean, I'm not always nice to him. (laughs) So, but it was just, we had this interesting discussion of what would it have been like in a society where there were no laws. And how laws are actually a blessing. It's creating a sense of how do I interact with people? What's community? Um, so the point was love God first and then often treat others, treat others well. Um, and it was interesting. I was also sort of pondering um, the law or as it's given. And I had this impression after my son Axel had said that God is my umbrella. I really had the sense that in so many ways, the Ten Commandments are sort of like an umbrella. They're this like protecting, coming in, not like stay in here. And this is where it is safe almost. It was an interesting image that I felt. So um, following this, God gives Moses additional laws to further unpack this t- these ten. If you ended up reading all of the end of Exodus, which is awesome if you did for those of you. Um, you probably read through all of those. It's really about how to treat each other, Sabbath laws, social responsibility, personal injury. Um, and so Moses brings all this to the people, and how are they going to respond? So I'm going to skip over to Exodus 24. And the Lord said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu with 70 of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. Everything the Lord has said, we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord has said. I love that because we see the beginning of the Pentateuch beginning to be created, right? Moses wrote it down. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in the bowls and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, this was already in existence, and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and they drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the, stone, the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with, his, with Joshua, his aide, and Moses went up the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and her are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up to the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up to the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. All right, so what do the people agree to do? Verse 4. Everything, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Uh, What does the Lord then ask Moses to do again? Where is he supposed to go? Back to the mountain. So he receives the law. He brings it to the people. The people say, yes, we will follow you. Yes, we will do this. Uh, And then Moses is supposed to go back up to the mountain. And why is he supposed to go back up? What is the Lord going to give him? The tablets, the two tablets, which are going to have the Ten Commandments on them. Um, And then who does Moses take with him? Joshua, remember that name, because Joshua is actually going to be the next leader of Israel. And so it's fun to see that even as a young man, he was considered faithful. He was kind of Moses' right-hand man, which is awesome. Um, And then who does Moses leave in charge? 
Aaron and her. So we know that Aaron is um, his big brother. So just for fun, I stuck in Google, who was her in the Bible? <laughs> just to see like what's going to pop up. And of course, like Wikipedia has great information about everything. And um, so there is dispute. So um, people are not actually sure exactly who he was. But what's cool is there are, okay, here's some big words, extra biblical rabbinical sources. So extra biblical, so outside the Bible, rabbinical sources. So rabbis that were writing sort of in the early um, like centuries, they talk about that they actually think that he was either possibly um, the husband of Miriam and father of Caleb, possibly, or they think that Caleb marries Miriam and her is their son. So, but somehow he was probably related to the family. Um, just a little extra trivia for fun. Um, so while Moses is on the mountain for um, 40 days, God instructs him um, then to build a tabernacle. So this is what we're going to look at for the next few moments. So he's going to go back up the mountain and he's going to, and God says, I am going to be in your presence. I want you to build a place of worship what we call a tabernacle. And this is going to be a movable sanctuary. So wherever they go, they can bring this movable sanctuary with them. All of the items are going to have rings on them that poles get put into so they can pick them up and they can carry them because they're still on their journey, right? They have not reached Canaan yet. Um, so now I'm going to skip over and read Exodus 25, starting with 1 through 9. So the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from me from everyone whose heart prompts them. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, another type of durable leather, um, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onk stones and other gems pre-mounted on ephod and breastplate. These, then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Um, so Exodus 25 through 40 really has all the details of the tabernacle. I am not going to read it all to you ladies, but I just kind of want to highlight. So you all actually have some little tabernacle pieces of paper on your de- on your tables. You can get them out if you want to. Um, and what's cool is I think it's interesting to see the visual of the tabernacle that was created uh, or that God is telling them to create. So um, there's going to be a tent of meeting, an outer courtyard, um, which is curtains. A curtain wall creates a rectangular a- area. This is going to be 150 feet by 75 feet. And outside in this area, oh, yeah, and you can also look up here. I have it up uh, in the front. Um, inside, there's going to be a basin for washing. So Aaron and his sons are going to be made the priests. These are going to become our Levitical clan. Our, our Levites are going to be our, our priestly clan. So the basin for washing to wash hands and feet whenever they went into the tent of meeting. Um, there's going to be an altar for a burnt um, offering. This is going to be for animals when they are sacrificed. Um, and Aaron and his sons are going to be anointed as the priests who are going to oversee all of this that's going to be happening. So then you go into the inner tent, which is going to be in this area um, on your diagrams. There's going to be the holy place out here and then the inside the most holy place. Um, in the holy place out here, there will be a table to hold the bread of the presence. So there's 12 loaves of bread signifying the 12 tribes of Israel are supposed to be baked daily and put there. Um, there's going to be, it, it was a continual offering. Priests could actually re- eat the bread after it was removed. So like day old bread. Um, there's going to be a gold lampstand, which was actually in the shape of a menorah. If anyone has ever seen a Jewish menorah, um, seven wicks are lit by pure oil and Aaron and his sons are to keep them lit from evening until morning every day. Um, an altar of incense also in here. And that was to be, Aaron was to light it every morning, every evening. And that was a a sweet smelling aroma that would go up to God every day. Um, so this was entered. So this area out here was entered by the priests on a daily basis. Now, we get into the Holy of Holies, this inner spot, and that is where um, what's called the Ark of the Covenant is going to be put. And this is a three and three quarters by two and a half foot box overlaid with gold. And inside, it's going to have the stone tablets that God is going to give Moses. They also have manna in it for a season. Um, The Ark was the very presence of God. No one could touch it. Um, the, The law would go in it. And Moses could go in, but what happens following Moses is that a priest could only enter 
this most holy of holies once a year. And it was to make atonement for the people of Israel. To the po- It's funny because this is not mentioned in the Bible, but what became tradition is that they would actually tie a rope with bells onto the ankle of the high priest who would go into the most holy of holies on an annual basis. Because if that person was not atoned for properly, he would just die. <laughs> and so then they would have to like pull him out. So, um, because you could only go in to the presence of God once a year. So I know I love that. Um, and so, um, <laughs> so Moses is up on the Mount. Uh, so actually back to this. So one thing that's so cool about this is I love setting up. Remember, I just feel like we have to study the Old Testament because that helps us understand the New Testament. So this same thing is going to be replicated um, in the first temple that Solomon builds. So it's essentially going to follow this exact same plan. And then that temple is going to be destroyed um, during the exile. Well, they will return. This is fast forwarding. This is in the future. We're going to cover this. The Israelites will return. And at that point, they will build another temple. And so this is the same structure of temple that is around when Jesus comes to Jerusalem. So it's not a tent anymore, but it's a temple in this exact same format. So um, remember how only once a year, right, the Simon could go into the Holy of Holies. So do you remember what happens in the temple at the moment that Jesus dies? This curtain right here is torn in two. And so what is happening is in that moment, God is saying, it's not just the high priest who has access to me once a year, but all of you have access to me anytime, all the time. And that that's the new covenant that's starting at that point. So I think it's really cool to just briefly look at the structure, understand what was created, because it helps us just get that visual even more when the curtain is torn into. Why is that such a big deal? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. It's, it's only, uh, the question is, why is it okay to touch it when they travel? Um, so it's on poles. So it was, the priestly clan was able to transport it. It was, it's, it's in there, but it's very specific priests were allowed to, um, transport it. But there is one moment, um, and this is again, fast forwarding, but a time of, in the time of David, I believe, but the ark is being transported and it starts to fall and, someone reaches over and touches it and that person dies like on the spot. So they weren't allowed to actually touch it, but they could transport it. And and when they moved was when God told them to move. I guess it was a sense of, that if God was leading them to move, then it was okay to take it all down. (laughs) Yeah. That was a really good thought though. I like it. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the specific text, but when they're allowed to move, certain priests are allowed to pack up the tabernacle and transport it. So, but you could never touch the actual ark. It was only the poles that you could touch. So that's why the poles are extended into it. Oh, the temple curtain. So when Jesus dies on the cross, that's when this temple curtain is torn in two. And that's showing that now God is present, that we all have access to God, not just the high priest. So, um, cool. All right. So we're going to keep moving on. Um, so, okay. So Moses is up on the mountain. He's getting all this, these instructions about the tabernacle, the laws, all this stuff. Um, 40 days and 40 nights he's up there. Um, so now we're going to pick up the story and see what happens to the Israelites while he's there. So I'm going to skip over to Exodus 32 and I'm going to read one through 14. All right. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold and earrings from your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And they said, then he said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. 
When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. The next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. And the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt. I love how God like puts it on him. Your people who you brought up out of Egypt <laughs> have become corrupt. They have become quick to turn away from what I commanded them. and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff necked people. Now leave me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought up out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them up, out, kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and will be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on the people the disaster he had threatened. Um, and then also skipping down, let's see. Um... Sorry, ladies, I've lost my place. Um, okay, no, we're just going to stop there for now. Okay, so how long has Moses been on the mountain at this point? 40 days. Um, and what do the people want? What do they ask for? Gods, gods who will go before them. And why? Why do they ask Aaron to make other gods? Why? Why? They don't know where Moses is. We don't know what happened to him. This fellow Moses. I love that. Um, and Aaron complies. And he makes a calf out of the gold jewelry that they all have. And then there's this festival and revelry. And I think it's kind of hard to understand what's going on with Aaron here and why he sort of allows them to do this. There's really no backstory. Um, but God tells Moses he's going to destroy the people because of this. And Moses acts as a mediator, petitioning God on behalf of of the people. Um, and it says that God relents. And really, this is like a big theological question that they debate in seminaries is, does God change his mind? Or is it, is the intent of what God says to cause Moses to respond a certain way? And I don't have an answer for that. But that's sort of the big question that's raised by these kinds of passages. Does God change his mind? Or does God say what he says to have Moses' heart become a certain way? I don't know. Yeah. Totally. 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 So the comment was like, how often do we not trust God? How often do we get tired of waiting? Exactly. Um, true. There's no repercussion on Aaron. Good point. That's a really good point, that there is no repercussion to Aaron. So somehow, yes. Yeah, he says, leaps out of the fire is how he talks about it. So, yes. So there is a sense that somehow Aaron is not held responsible. I think that's a really good point you ladies are making. Really good. That's awesome. Um, okay, so what does Moses do? I'm going to go to 33, um, 19 through 20, and then 25. Um, when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf that the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it into powder, powder, scattered it in the water, and made the Israelites drink it. I don't know if those of you who are here on Sunday, I thought Mike was great. He talked about, like, a pretty much um, <laughs> Moses is like an angry parent. Like, I can't believe you did that. And he just sort of, like, has this moment of kind of, <laughs> like, extreme anger. I mean, how random is it, right? Like, he grinds up this calf. And makes them drink it. Like, it's such a random punishment. But you can just tell, like, Moses is mad. (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. No, I have a friend. I have a friend who still will wash her children's mouth out with soap. And I have threatened my children with it. (laughs) Do you know what this mommy does? You know her. (laughs) Totally. Yes. It seems a... It seems a very parental at that moment. Um, okay, and then I'm also going to finish up reading 25 through 35. Moses saw the people were running wild, and Aaron had let them get out of control and so, be- and so become a laughingstock to their enemies, who stood at the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the Levites rallied to him. And he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man, the hard words to read, each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and, God, and he has blessed you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, You have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. And the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did, the calf that Aaron had made. So, um we see repercussion for their sin, um, death as a result. We also see Moses asking God for forgiveness for the people. At, and we just really see, I think, his heart as a leader at this point, how he is just desiring for God to be patient with them, to relent. And uh, I think it's a hard story, we, but I also think we often focus on the results, the death and the plague. But also, I mean, I was like, think about these people. Okay, so they have just pledged that they are not going to follow any other gods. Forty days, 40 days earlier, they had just pledged, I will not make a single image to, uh, to God. I will not worship any other gods. And, you know, they had seen the ten plagues, the Red Sea parting, the pillar of cloud and fire, the manna and quail. Like, they had seen these really visual it, moments of God showing up and yet they're going to make these gods after 40 days. It's, um, you know, it's hard, I think, to, to read this, but we do see mercy in that God doesn't destroy them entirely. And we see the patience of God being patient with them as they are trying to figure this out. And also, you know, we have to go back and look at their historical context. Where had they all come from? They come from Egypt, right? This multi-God system. This was still a very brand new thing to them to have one God that we worship. And I realized, even as I did background research for the, for the study, like this is the first monotheistic religion that had ever happened. Up before, it was only multiple gods. It was, you know, gods of, of the earth and sun and everything. And so this is still a new thing for them to try and get their brains around, that there is only one God, and we only worship this one God. Um, so Moses returns to the mountain. He gets two more tablets from God. Um, and this is um, great. God then proclaims his name to Moses. I'm going to skip over. Just read verse thirty or chapter 34, 5 through 7. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord of compa- the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. So, I don't know. I kind of like and don't like the idea of punishment. You know, there's this very human part of me that's like, yes, get them. And then like, no, be patient. <laughs> like it's, it's, I think it's a very normal response. I feel like in, in some ways I don't want to be punished. Like, you know, maybe when I have sort of gods in my life, you know, other things that somehow take precedence over God for seasons in my own life or possibly trying not to worship my children, you know, like as moms, that's so hard not to put everything into our children and make them the most important thing. 
that I always want forgiveness, you know, when I am not a hundred percent correct. Um, and then there's definitely part of me though, that wants like others to be punished, you know, if they are not acting correctly, like if someone were to crash into my brand new car, I have a brand new car, I would be so mad. You know, I would want them to have to pay for my car. I would want punishment or if some kid were to bully my kid. Oh, you know, like mama bear is going to come out. So I think inside of us, there is a sense of desiring justice. We understand right and wrong. Elizabeth. We don't get much backstory, but yeah, essentially it's these. I think the idea is it would have been the people who were worshiping this golden calf. So, the, yeah, so there's this sort of revelry going on, almost like this big crazy party. I don't know. And so it's that group that it seems to me that the Levites go after. Well, I think there's this moment, you know, where God says, who is with me? And so these Levites come to the side of Moses. And, um, and so at that moment, there's this minute or this moment of, yeah, it's kind of what it is. It's purging. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not an easy passage to read. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, good question. In our lives, do we anticipate punishment even when we are asking for forgiveness? What do you ladies think? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, in the Catholic Church that there's a sense of you ask forgiveness and then there's sort of a, a penitence, right, afterwards, a uh, sort of a punishment. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, they were under what's called the old covenant, and now we're under the new covenant, so it's different. Um, but I think what's important to see is that there is, we do still see that God is a God of grace and mercy, even back then. He does not destroy them all. I, th- I think it's important to see that the character of God is continuous. We do see a God of grace and mercy even at this moment. Mm -hmm. But that's even true now, the sense that if, you know, those who choose to not live a life following Jesus, they're still making that choice to not live with God. They're still making the choice for punishment. Consequences. Consequences is a good word for it. That's a really good way to say it. Consequences versus punishment. I think that's a good word. You're right, because our choices have consequences. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Yes, that would be a discipline different from punishment. That would be a whole other discussion. True. Um, mm-hmm. And it's true. It is all true. Um, and remember, we are, again, looking at a time of the old covenant versus the new covenant. And that is important to distinguish. Um, let's continue. So Moses um, returns to the people. He instructs them to create the tabernacle for the Lord. Uh, He says God's presence would be with them. He takes an offering from the people to construct it. And it's really beautiful language where he says, um, it's an attitude of the heart. He says, all who are willing should bring um, gold and should bring their um, yarn. And I'm not going to actually go through all of it, but it's really this, it's beautiful. So um, the idea is that service should not be this act of grumbling, that it's people should offer out of free will and out of goodwill. And, 
and it's great. He says, all who are skilled and willing acted. So we have this really cool moment of also seeing this picture of, of art, of artistry and creativity and how God was the original artist, the first creator of beauty and how this tabernacle that is created is created as a beautiful thing by the skill of the people. Um, I just love that. This, we see that God was our first creator of beauty. Um, so the tent of meeting is completed. It's set up exactly as instructed by God. We're given a very specific date in uh, 4017. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the month in the second year. Second year since they had left Egypt. Um, there's a Bible footnote that it, in my Bible that says, so it was New Year's Day, the start of the second year after the Israelites had left Egypt. And they had nine months after arriving at Mount Sinai. They're going to end up actually being at Mount Sinai for a full year before they're going to continue on in their journey. Um, we see this really cool image of God showing up. The work is done. Everything is set for this tabernacle. I'm going to read uh, chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. Okay. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. But the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. All right. Um, so the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle and it's really the sign of blessing of God's presence being with them. Um, we see this again, actually with Solomon. So Solomon is the third King of Israel. This is a, we're fast forwarding and we're going to get to Solomon, but the first King of Israel, Saul, and then David, and then David's son, Solomon. And so Solomon is instructed by God that he can build a permanent temple in Jerusalem fashioned after this tabernacle. And I'm just going to very briefly skip ahead to 1 Kings 8. You don't have to skip with me. 1 Kings 8, 10 through 12 says, When the priests withdrew from the holy place, so they've now filled, they've now set up a brand new permanent temple, um, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud, the glory of the Lord filled it. So why I'm bringing this up is because, again, we're going to see that God has been blessing this future temple that's going to be created. His presence is going to show up. Um, and we see, we see this as a sign of blessing. Um, but what's interesting, and I think this is um, interesting to me at least, is we don't see the same thing happening with the second temple that is built. So there's going to be exile. The Israelites will return to Jerusalem, and they're going to rebuild their temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead briefly to Ezra 6, 15 through 18. The temple was completed on the third day of the month, Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. And the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 male lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their division and the Levites in the groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what was written in the book of Moses. And then it ends. So what's missing? The cloud. So the cloud doesn't come back and fill the temple again when it's rebuilt after the exile. And... What happens actually because of this moment is we got, we started to have this period of disillusionment in the Israelite people. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah, Malachi are the last books of the, of the Old Testament, the ending that time of the exile. We're going to get to, this is again in the future, we'll get to it, but what's called the intertestamental period, 400 years of silence, 400 years from when the last prophecy, Malachi occurs, when the new next prophet, John the Baptist, shows up. And during this period, there's going to be this really, um, this period of disillusionment for the Israelite people. It's 400 years where there's no prophecy. They don't hear from God. God never shows up. And so they're, they're really, they don't understand what's going on. They rebuilt their temple, just like the tabernacle, just like the temple that Solomon had built. Yet this cloud, this presence of God does not show up again. And so they start wondering what's going on. Where is God? Is he, does he still care about us? And 
it's because of that, that moment of not, of God not showing up for them. It's going to begin raising all these questions in their mind. So, um, so I just thought that would be a fun little fast forward. So what have we seen today? So God establishes the law and the Ten Commandments. We see that Jesus actually is going to sum up all of the law and commandments in Matthew 22, 36, 40. He says, uh, all of the law is summed up in love the Lord, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and your, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so that is what essentially the law is saying is love others, lo- love God, love others. That's how Jesus will sum it up. Uh, and we saw how the Israelites quickly forsake God, how, but God is patient with them. And we also saw the creation of the tabernacle, the presence of God descending, um, Sunday, Mike talked about how the Israelites just couldn't wait on God, how they'd had all these miracles, 40 days without Moses, and and it turns into pure pure rebellion. So thinking about how do we apply what we have read to our own lives, um, are there places where we need to wait on God in our own lives? Are there places where we need to wait for God to show up that we're not supposed to act? Um, we saw that God wants to be present in the midst of his people, the very center of his people. That's where the tabernacle went. So the camp was actually constructed around the tabernacle. So God wants to be intimately involved in our lives. He wants to be the center of our lives. Um, God wants our relationship with him to be the most important thing above all other things. That What things do I make more important than God? What things we make more important than God? Are there our idols in our own lives, things that we put as higher priorities to God? So I'm going to let you ladies talk for a few minutes at your tables. I have some questions for you. The questions are, um, do you feel like God is telling you there's an area in your life where you need to wait on him right now? And if you're comfortable, share that with your group. Um, What kinds of things do we make more important than God? You feel like there's something God is asking you to give up or possibly start doing. And then lastly, if you're comfortable, is there anything the group can pray for for you? So I'm going to let you ladies have about uh, 11 or 12 minutes of table time, and then I will close us at the end.